while Lisa's getting set up a couple announcements, we'll move from here to the posters. And then the posters uh, will uh, transition. That'll be the posters will be six to seven. Is that correct? Or well, we'll be we'll start a little late, but we'll move to posters. Then at seven o'clock uh, at the terrace, there will be a photograph, group photograph at seven, and then a reception after that. So be there to be photographed, so we can all get a nice shot of everyone together. And uh, we should capture one of the, we should tell everybody with their camera on and get one of these online uh, shots too. Um, and, uh, and then we'll have the reception after seven. Okay, I see Elisa is there and she's getting set up. Elisa. Hello you, everyone. <laughs> can, can you, you hear me? We can hear you and see you. All okay. right, the floor very is good. yours. Thank you very much. Let me hide the floating MIDI control. Okay, very good. So thank you very much for this invitation. And uh, like Mehmet, I'm sorry not to be there in beautiful Italy. <laughs> but the good thing is that the weather is finally good also in New York. Took a while. Okay, so good morning from me and good evening from you uh, to everyone. Uh, for the ones of you who do not uh, uh, know my work, uh, it's, uh, I'm an experimentalist and my group is uh, heavily involved in scanning probe microscopy for nanomechanics study from friction to elasticity and also solid liquid interfaces. But we also have uh, a, a quite a lot of research going on on thermal scanning probe lithography which I will not talk today, but you know, just to have an overview of what we do in our lab. So um, lately, a, a really a focus in my lab has been on Van der Waals materials. Van der Waals materials like graphene that everybody knows or transition metal decalcogenide, uh, boronitride, um, they are uh, characterized by very strong in-plane bonds. So for example, for graphite, uh, this gives rise to a very high elastic uh, constant C11 in-plane, which is about uh, one terapascal. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, on the transverse side, uh, the elasticity is uh, much softer. Uh, so in fact, uh, the C33 perpendicular to the plane uh, elastic constant is only 36 uh, gigapascal. So this high anisotropy in the mechanical properties and also um, in uh, the electronic properties gives rise to many interesting properties in this material. And while uh, uh, quite a lot of studies have been done uh, on the uh, in-plane uh, elasticity of these materials, uh, think about uh, all the elasticity measurement done for, for example, graphene or other 2D materials deposited on membrane, where atomic force microscopy tips are used to indent and then measure the elastic properties. Uh, much less is known on the uh, transverse properties, and in particular, what is happening in between the layers, right? So if you have your uh, two layer, three layer, for example, 2D uh, film on a solid substrate, and you want to investigate the Van der Waals interaction between the layer or the transverse elasticity, and then understand how this is, for example, related to other uh, properties like friction and dissipation, then you need uh, to have access, first of all, to uh, these properties. But uh, uh, this part of, uh, uh, of the work required uh, also some uh, novel uh, um, experimental de development, because uh, as you can uh, easily see here, right? Uh, when you bend a graphene on top of, or another 2D uh, film, on top of a, a membrane, your indentation depth of, of, or are of the order of 100 nanometers, which is something, let's say, relatively easy uh, to measure with an atomic force microscope. On the other hand, if you have a two-layer film of, say, three layers or two layers 
on a substrate, on a rigid substrate, and you want to indent and measure the elasticity between the film, then your indentation needs to be very small. Otherwise, you don't measure anymore the interlayer elasticity, but you measure a coupling with, uh, for example, the, the substrate elasticity. So ideally, your indentation needs to be of the order of the Armstrong. So then uh, you are in a very different regime and you need uh, a different uh, type of uh, uh, methodology. So uh, because of this, um, we have developed what uh, uh, we called Armstrong indentation, just to maintain uh, the tradition of uh, micro indentation, nano indentation. Now we are into the Armstrong indentation regime, it's always using atomic force microscopes. This is a method inspired by the work of uh, uh, Karpik uh, and Salmeron in uh, 1997. And uh, um, I'm not going uh, to enter too much into details on the uh, methodology. But uh, this methodology, as you will see, will be very similar to an, another methodology that I will talk more extensively in this uh, uh, seminar here. Um, the general idea is uh, to use uh, a, a modulation and to first indent in the material and then by very tiny sub and strong modulation, uh, uh, withdraw the tip uh, and then uh, measure the change in force uh, uh, as a function of uh, uh, the changing load. And uh, by integrating this curve, you have uh, uh, force versus indentation curve that, as you can see here, uh, give rise to um, a resolution that is smaller than one Armstrong. And this allows us to measure very uh, stiff materials and more importantly to measure uh, 2D materials uh, on rigid substrates. And this, um, so this is a little bit, uh, uh, this is the reference uh, to the article that I was saying and this is, uh, mm, sorry, my, uh, can't see anymore my mouse here. Bye -bye. Not sure why it disappeared. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. Uh, are you still hearing what I'm saying? Yep, we, we see you and hear you, but we also don't see your mouse. <laughs> I wonder if uh, you may just need to see <laughs> my, my. Very sorry for this. Uh, I don't know what happened. So let me maybe, um, it looks like my computer is having a problem. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's like it's completely frozen. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay, let's see if I can. Uh, okay. So we just unshared your screen. Okay, very good. Oh, now I think Elisa's frozen. Okay, I think she's had a computer crash. That's my guess. Lisa, if you can hear us, you are she's now frozen. Still she's still smiling. That's true. That's how... We're guessing she may need to reboot. Hmm. Yeah, we, we made it through the whole day without any major technical glitches. So unfortunately, we got cursed at the very end. But uh, my, my, yeah, my guess is she's, she's just needs to restart, but things are working fine on our side. There, okay, now she's dropped off. Okay, she'll, she'll reconnect in a minute.
So for those of you online, please bear with us. We think Elisa will be back online momentarily. Okay. Uh, I think it's, it's not an issue that gone. She, 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 she was supposed to be a co-host. They did it. That's something that went wrong. I'm very sorry. I don't know what happened. Nope, no problem. We see you I'm and very... hear you again. So welcome back. Okay, I'm very, very sorry. Okay. Mm. Hopefully now will be good. Mm. Okay, so uh, we are, we arrive here. Uh, so this is the modulated uh, Armstrong indentation method that I was describing before, where we use a low keen to apply a very tiny modulation to the piezo tube, and then we detect the change in force. And essentially, we for every load, uh, we measure delta F over delta Z. And then by integrating, we really decrease quite a lot uh, the uh, signal to noise ratio. OK, uh, by doing this type of studies, uh, we have recently uh, discovered something uh, very interesting, which is uh, a phase transition uh, of uh, uh, epitaxial graphene which is a, a graphene grown on silicon carbide um, when under pressure into a diamond phase. So um, the, uh, the transition occurs at room temperature and under the action of the AFM tip, we were able to detect a, a change as you can see here. So this is a typical uh, image of uh, epitaxial graphene. So you have silicon carbide, then you have a buffer layer, and then you have one layer or, or two layer on top. So um, our results have indicated that uh, by doing, as, um, as I was saying, this indentation curves on silicon carbide, bare silicon carbide, you know, we get an elasticity, a young modulus of 400 about gigapascal, which is what we expect for silicon carbide. On the other hand, for graphite, we get a, um, a transverse modulus of uh, uh, 36 gigapascal, which is exactly the transverse uh, uh, elastic modulus of graphite which is the same as the 10 layer graphite, 10 layer graphene on silicon carbide, five layer graphene on silicon carbide, the stiffness is a little bit higher because probably we start to feel more the substrate. Uh, when we measure the buffer layer, so only this layer here, so there is nothing on top, we essentially measure the young modulus of the silicon carbide, again, nothing uh, unexpected. What really was unexpected was what happened when you have 
one buffer layer plus one layer. So we call this two layer graphene. It may be a little bit misleading because depending on the community you're in um, is really buffer layer plus one layer, uh, the exact uh, uh, situation, but we call it two layer graphene to indicate that you really have two layer of uh, a carbon on top of silicon carbide. So when we measure this type of system, as you can see here, we get a stiffness that is much higher than silicon carbide, higher than sapphire, and close to the stiffness of uh, uh, bulk CVD diamond. So in order to explain this, uh, um, we work with uh, a theorist who uh, run some uh, molecular dynamic simulation, uh, DFT simulation, and they indeed, uh, uh, actually the simulation are here, proved the formation of a single layer diamond. So uh, we are undergoing more and more studies about this very interesting uh, um, uh, phase transition, also in other system like hexagonal boronitride. Uh, we, are all, we also started to run uh, uh, current AFM measurement to understand at what load you really see this phase transition. And we um, realized that the load is about 250 uh, nanonewton. So based on uh, all uh, uh, these type of studies, uh, we also started to be more interested into the dissipation uh, uh, mechanism. And that is uh, um, something that uh, uh, is the second part of my seminar uh, today. And uh, that I really, it's also the more new part of our work, um, which uh, uh, came a little bit as a surprise because uh, um, the idea was for us really to investigate more uh, the dissipation due to the phase transition. But before entering into that, we started to say, okay, uh, before studying the dissipation after or through the phase transition, let's get a plateau of what happened much before. So for loads much smaller. So when the phase transition still does not occur. And uh, um, so uh, this is uh, uh, the work that we started to do. So we were interested uh, now not uh, uh, to study the, um, uh, the, the transverse elasticity um, in the direction perpendicular to the plane, but we were interested in studying the shear uh, elasticity. So the shear elasticity, um, the way we uh, started to look at was by using very small loads that give rise to uh, extremely small indentation. And when I say small indentation, I'm really talking about uh, sub Armstrong. So maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2 type of indentation. So uh, the, um, you essentially almost, I would say, uh, zero indentation, right? Um, and the, but the tip is still in contact, so uh, with uh, the graphene film. Um, and underneath, we have the silicon carbide structure or other type of structure that I will talk in a moment. And then we slide off a very small amount and we stay in the elastic regime. In this way, we measure the, um, what we call the interfacial shear modulus of the top atomic layer in respect to everything that you have underneath. Um, we started to uh, play with this type of uh, um, uh, experiments with two different systems. One is a regular epitaxial graphene system, where, like I, saw, uh, I described before, you have freestanding graphene, and then you have this famous buffer layer, which is a mix of sp2, sp3 bonding with uh, the silicon carbide uh, substrate. So it's really an interfacial carbon layer. And then we have this system where hydrogen has been intercalated between the buffer layer and the silicon carbide. And so this buffer layer is released and becomes a quasi freestanding monolayer graphene as you 
can see from the name here. So then again, you can have one quasi freestanding, two quasi freestanding monolayer, and so on. And you have hydrogen here that saturates the dangling bond of silicon carbide. So these are the um, all the system that we have uh, uh, studied. So we have one layer graphene plus buffer layer on silicon carbide. We have two layer plus buffer layer. We have quasi freestanding one layer with the hydrogen intercalation. And then we have two layer with the hydrogen intercalation. Then we have a different system, which is a 10 layer graphene, but now grown on the uh, carbon phase of uh, 6H silicon carbide. And because of this, the stacking is a very interesting stacking with essentially twisted layer uh, where the layers are alternating 30 degree and 2 degree, 30 degree and 2 degree compared to the silicon carbide axis. And then we work on bulk graphite. And we performed interfacial shear modulus experiment on each of this sample. So always keep in mind that what we do, we shear of a tiny bit the top layer compared to what you have underneath. So in this case, for example, you have to think about sharing this top layer compared to all this substrate underneath, the same here, the same here, and so on. Okay, so what we have uh, found? Well, first of all, this is an overview of the methodology. So very similar to the modulated Armstrong indentation I showed before, except that now we shear laterally. And essentially what we do, we move in this area where, you know, this is the classical lateral force versus displacement that we have seen many times in this conference, right? This will give rise to our uh, static friction and then our kinetic friction and the stick and slip. So in this part uh, where we have just uh, uh, the contact, right? Where you essentially just pull your contact the, uh, um, the change in lateral force divided by the change in displacement gives you the total effective stiffness, which is uh, um, a stiffness given by a, a two springs in series. One is the cantilever uh, lateral um, spring constant, and the other one is really the uh, stiffness of your tip substrate contact. So the shear modulus, the interfacial shear modulus is inside this quantity. On the other hand, we know exactly what is the lateral spring constant of our uh, cantilever. So the torsional spring constant of our cantilever. So we can, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, found from the experiment, we can found this value. And then we use a locking amplifier to deeply uh, really decrease, to dramatically decrease the signal to noise ratio. So we go in contact, we apply a certain load, as I said before, quite a small load, but enough to keep the contact. And then we move essentially along this line here for some displacement that is uh, uh, smaller than uh, one Armstrong. I think it's uh, 0 0.3 Armstrong. Okay, um, next, we obtain the lateral uh, spring, uh, the lateral contact stiffness as a function of the load. And this contact stiffness based on contact mechanics is given by eight times the interfacial effective uh, shear modulus times A, where A is the contact radius. Since the contact radius is a function of the load, adhesion, Young modulus, which we can measure with the modulated nano indentation method that I shown to you before, so we really can measure the Young modulus of the interface, right? We know the tip radius, so all this part is known. We can obtain the interfacial effective shear modulus. How we obtain this, we just uh, um, plot the uh, experimental lateral contact um, stiffness as a function of the load, as you can see here, 
And then we use this same equation to fit the experimental data. And these are the results. So for the different sample, we obtain values of the order of 100 of megapascal. Um, so first observation is that the modulus that we are measuring is indeed not a, a shear modulus of in-plane graphene because the shear modulus of in-plane graphene, so if we would stretch the graphene layers, so we would get more uh, values that are more of the order of the terapascal. Uh, on the other hand, we measure uh, very low values. So these very low values uh, indicate that what we are measuring is more the out of plane shear modulus, which is what I anticipated at the beginning. So it's really the sliding of the top layer compared to the substrate. And this makes sense, right? Because again, uh, it's like having two uh, springs and one it's extremely stiff and the other one it's much softer. So what we measure is the soft spring. After that, uh, let's try to understand, right? What we have measured and let's try to see how this uh, interfacial shear modulus is, which is an elastic constant, uh, is related to the dissipation and to the atomic scale friction. So first of all, let's try to understand the origin of these numbers. So this is something that took us quite a lot of work and I must say is really not finished because I think we will need really to work with theorists. So I'm also asking help from the audience if there are anybody here interested in a, co in a collaboration because we have some, how to say, um, ideas of where these numbers are coming from. But of course, these are more, uh, um, more uh, 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 possibilities. There are no proof that this is really the origin of uh, these numbers. So I plotted here the interfacial shear modulus values for the different system. This here we have bulk graphite, here we have uh, two layer on hydrogen. So this is the, let me see, put here. So this is two layer graphene on hydrogen intercalated silicon carbide. So it's this type of structure, but with two layer. This is one layer. So this is exactly this structure. Then we have two layer on buffer layer. So this is, uh, uh, this structure plus one layer, so two layer plus buffer. Then we have twisted 10 layer graphene, which is the structure that I was telling you. So it's 10 layer, but the layer are twisted in terms of stacking. And then we have one layer on buffer layer silicon carbide, which is exactly the structure you see here. Okay, so why uh, uh, we get this type of change in interfacial shear modulus? We think that there are uh, uh, three main factors here. One is the stacking. I put it, uh, I listed here. One is the stacking. One is the substrate interaction. And the third one is the substrate shear stiffness. So let's start from the stacking. So the stacking actually is the one that has uh, the most uh, um, motivation because there are studies uh, performed by Annalisa Fasolino, uh, DFT studies that indicate that the C44 uh, elastic constant in graphite, which is essentially uh, the, the interfacial shear models that we are measuring, uh, strongly depend on the stacking. And she demonstrated that, for example, the AB stacking, which I um, uh, put it here, uh, the AB stacking is the most uh, uh, stable stacking in graphite and uh, um, is also giving rise to the largest number of uh, interfacial shear modulus. Um, for this reason, uh, I indicated here the three structures that have uh, um, a, B stacking. So uh, bulk graphite here has uh, A, B stacking, uh, two layer on hydrogenated silicon carbide, 
AB stacking, two layer on buffer layer, also AB stacking. Now, as you can see, this is not enough to explain all our results because this structure here, which does not have uh, AB stacking, in fact, uh, um, one layer um, on silicon carbide doesn't have any stacking at all because it's, uh, a, it's just one layer graphene, right? Still has uh, a, um, a, a, a shear modulus that is much larger than one layer, for example, on buffer layer, layer graphene on buffer layer. So why this one layer on hydrogen, which is here, is much larger than one layer on buffer layer. So the explanation that we have here is uh, uh, given by the presence of this hydrogen. So what we believe is happening is that this hydrogen is actually hindering the motion. Uh, whereas uh, the uh, one layer on buffer layer, uh, it's a non-commensurate structure. And we think that uh, also it's a mix. Uh, uh, TM studies indicate that they have a mix of AB and AC stacking. So it's a disorder, if you want, interface, carbon-carbon uh, interface. And so we think that uh, um, that's the reason why this has a, such a low shear modulus, interfacial shear modulus, compared to this structure here that is on the other hand hindered by the presence of uh, hydrogen. We also think that hydrogen could be attached to the top graphene. And so there could be almost like a Velcro type of uh, sliding, which increase even more the shear um, uh, elasticity. OK, um, the third, uh, so the other uh, low values is given by twisted 10 layer graphene and again, we think this is due to the fact that uh, uh, the, uh, the stacking uh, is really not uh, um, the preferential stacking. And so the structure is uh, looser. Uh, finally, the su substrate shear stiffness is important. So for example, if you look at the two green here, they should have the same values. But because this one is on top of a stiffer substrate, which is essentially this structure here, compared to this one, which is on top of this substrate, then uh, you really have an increase. And indeed, the, the ratio between this green and this red is exactly the same ratio as this green and this red, indicating really that uh, um, the substrate, it simply shift uh, the uh, value of the shear modulus of the top layer. That said, uh, we moved on to understand the relationship with friction and dissipation. So we perform friction uh, studies, atomic force microscopy friction studies on the different uh, sample. Uh, we then calculating the, you know, we plotted the friction versus normal load. And uh, uh, we look into the friction coefficient. We also, um, and we started to see all sorts of differences for all the different materials. Then to compare them, since they have a different stiffness, we uh, plotted the friction as a function of the contact area. And as you can see, the data gives quite good linear curves. And so then we extracted the slope of this curve, which is the friction per unit contact area. In this way, we were able to compare all the different materials, even if they have a different stiffness. And then we plotted the friction per unit contact area as a function of the measured interfacial shear modulus for all the material measured. And uh, um, with a very nice surprise, they were all sitting on top of, a, uh, of the same uh, general curve. And this is a, a simple reciprocal curve um, with uh, um, uh, is general for all the different uh, uh, materials. Uh, and uh, uh, interestingly, what you can see here is that, uh, um, for example, for the two materials that have uh, uh, the two layer and one layer, this two structure here, 
So these two material, by coincidence, they have a very similar shear modulus. Well, they also have a very similar friction per unit area. So it really looks like uh, that the interfacial shear modulus is an extremely important parameter to um, control uh, interfacial, to control uh, nanoscale friction. Now, of course, we know that there are many parameters that control friction, but what is important here to consider is that the material is always a graphitic material, so we didn't change the chemistry, and uh, we, uh, uh, um, uh, how to say, we eliminated the impact also of the contact area because uh, we normalize per uh, contact area. That said, uh, we try to understand. Oh, Alicia, let me let me jump in for a second. Uh, accounting for the delays, I think we're getting close to the time allotted, and we are also getting close to running up against the need for a po our poster session. So I'm wondering how how quickly can you wrap this okay. up? Okay, is I just have two slides and okay, then it's great. finished. Okay, Wonderful. so so this is the 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 model. So this is the familiar Tomlinson model. And by looking into, you know, by running si very simple simulation of the Tomlinson model and then plotting uh, the friction as a function of uh, the interfacial shear modulus, as you can see here, we really get uh, a very similar uh, result uh, obtained from our experiment. And we even get the same type of uh, uh, fitting function, which is a simple reciprocal function, which as you can see here, works better than a, a exponential decay. We also work with the group of Ariel Tosati uh, to do a, a little bit more complex type of simulation. This is a Frankel contour oval uh, simulation where the tip is sliding on top of a series of springs, which are atop a, uh, um, periodic uh, uh, potential and the periodic potential here mimic the substrate interface while the springs mimic the, uh, the graphene structure. And again, what we obtain is something similar. So it's the, um, the, 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 um, the strong uh, uh, coupling of uh, the friction force uh, with uh, the interfacial uh, shear elasticity. Okay, with that, uh, I'm sorry to rush a little bit, but I would like to thank you everybody, my group and the funding agency. Thank you very right, much. Thank you. All right, we do have time for a couple of questions. <laughs> Over here. Uh, okay, uh, what uh, we uh, perhaps simple question: How the um, this PT model fits your experiment? Because the samples are not point-like. Yeah, uh, the sample is not point-like. But this PT model is yes, uh, yes, for yeah for point-like samples. Um. Uh, mm, I wouldn't say, what do you mean point like? So the, uh, it's a one dimensional. So it's, uh, you know, you have a, a um, uh, an interatomic potential, right? An interaction yeah, potential, the and then you a have- single particle, yeah? In this PT yeah. model, the tip is, is a single particle. Yes, uh, yes, it's a single particle. Yes, it's a single particle moving on top of the potential. And yes, I mean, your extended uh, sample. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it does fit it because, of course, it doesn't fit the exact numbers, right? Uh, but it fits the uh, relationship uh, indicating so it's a friction per unit area, okay? So that's what uh, we have uh, uh, plotted. And uh, uh, in these terms, it fits the relationship between the friction and uh, the interfacial shear modulus. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks. Anyway, Ali is here around, I think, and I will discuss with him later on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Last quick question. Um, do you hear me? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Okay, so thank you very much for this splendid talk. I have a very, oh, it's not a simple question. I think it's, uh, I'm very <laughs> curious to know if you had compare, um, you can measure the back models, the shear models, which is absolutely fantastic. Did you try to compare this value to um, the bulk value? I mean, did you, um, do you have the, the possibility to, 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 to check that the Poisson ratio is okay yeah. or it's not, but it's a question more or less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question actually, because uh, uh, we don't, uh, so I would say that's really uh, the question that we also uh, have is, is the, no. So the, the short question is uh, at the moment, no, we don't have any way to really measure the Poisson ratio. So, um, so the, we just assume that the Poisson ratio is the Poisson ratio of graphite, okay. but, uh, but it may not be it is not exactly. Obvious. Yeah, I agree with you, it may not, because it's of the interface, right? It's the Poisson ratio mm -hmm. of that particular interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with that, uh, let's uh, thank Elisa again for this uh, wonderful talk and thank all the speakers this afternoon. We will now move to the poster session. Uh, we have 11 posters and Ario advises me we will see